Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to have everybody back in here again, and uh, we'll be turning once more to Colossians chapter 1, where we just left off. And for those of you joining us on television, again, we like to thank you for your letters, your prayers, your help, and uh, above all, we appreciate the fact that you're searching the scriptures, you're studying, and uh, sharing it with others. After all, this is what turned the Roman Empire upside down, and uh, this is what made Paul's apostleship so unique, is uh, that he got those new believers into the Word, even though they didn't have the printed Word as we have, yet uh, it made such an impact on society. <clears throat> that the world around them knew that uh, those ex-pagans were a different breed of people once they came to know salvation. I uh, always like to remind folks we're not associated with any one group. I am a member of a local church, don't worry about that, but uh, I don't wear a denominational patch on my sleeve, and uh, I know not everybody agrees with me, and they don't have to. I can always tell people, well, if you disagree, that's fine. If you're comfortable with that, that's your privilege. But uh, all I want you to do is be sure you disagree scripturally. Well, anyway, uh, all the past programs are available on videotape and the printed page as well as the audio cassettes. So if you're interested in any of those, you uh, let us know. And then if you'd like to get our quarterly newsletter and you're not on our mailing list, let us know your name and address and we'll get that out to you as well. All right, we got a lot to cover. Goodness, I thought I was going to have a hard time filling four programs with the little book of Colossians. And here we aren't even out of chapter 1, verse 12. I, I'm always amazed myself. Verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father, who hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Giving thanks to the Father. Now that reminds me, I've had several questions lately. It's funny how they sort of come in groups. Where is it appropriate to pray to the Father in this age of grace? Well, I taught it, and I'd forgotten when I taught it, but I found it the other day. And I'm going to have you turn back with me to Ephesians chapter 5. <clears throat> because maybe even some of you or some of the listening audience have wondered, uh, since we're in the age of grace, do we still pray to the Father? As the Lord's Prayer, as the model prayer, instructed our Father which art in heaven. Yes, that has not changed. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20. And I think this is as clear cut an answer as you can get. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20. All got it? Ephesians 5, verse 20. Plain and simple. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that exactly how we do it? And so it's still appropriate. Yes, we do pray to the Father, and we do all in the name, then, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to see that relationship in the Trinity in a little later uh, verses. But for now, come back to, again, Colossians chapter 1. So Paul, as he prays to the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, he has thanked God, the Father, that he took these Colossians, out of paganism, out of darkness, under the chains of the satanic powers, and translated them into the heavenly kingdom. Now, what happened to the Colossians has happened to us. We too have been translated from a position in darkness, and we are now citizens of the heavenly kingdom. Now, Paul does not make a big ado about our kingdom relationship, because after all, that's primarily associated with the nation of Israel. But when Christ came to the nation of Israel, and John the Baptist announced him, 
And he said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, what was he talking about? The king was in their midst, see? The king, literally, physically, in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, was in their midst, and he was offering them the opportunity to have the kingdom over which Christ would rule and reign. And so that was the whole concept as it came to the nation of Israel. Now, we're not associated with the nation of Israel in that kind of a kingdom relationship, but since Israel's king is our savior and is the head of the body, here again we do have a relationship. And for some reason or other, the Holy Spirit has caused Paul to put this in here, that we have been made citizens of the kingdom in heaven. And that I can agree with 100%. But I still maintain that Paul never calls Christ our King. We are not in a king-subject relationship. We are in the head of the body and members of the body, which makes us heirs with Christ, joint heirs, as we just saw in our last program, married to Christ in a spiritual relationship. <clears throat> but nevertheless, we are now citizens of this heavenly kingdom because God the Father has delivered us from the power of darkness. All right, now let's go back. Let's go back. Let's compare Scripture with Scripture. And again, we'll even go outside of Paul's realm and go all the way back to Matthew, chapter 16. Matthew, chapter 16. For those of you who have been under my teaching very long, we've heard this more than once, because this is Peter's confession of his saving faith during Christ's earthly ministry. Matthew 16. And remember, this is just at the end of his ministry. From here, they're going to go on up to Jerusalem, and he will be crucified. <clears throat> they're up in northern Israel, uh, in the area that's in the news lately, uh, just west of the Golan Heights. They were up there at Caesarea Philippi, which, of course, is at the northern border of Israel, right at the foot of Mount Hermon, and at the headwaters of the Jordan River. Whenever we go to Israel, periodically, we can't do it every time, but we try to go up there. We were there two years ago at the headwaters at Caesarea Philippi. So I know it's up there in northern Israel. All right, so from there, they're going to make their way down to Jerusalem and the crucifixion. But here they are, up at Caesarea Philippi, verse 13, and he asked his disciples, say, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Verse 14, they said, some say you're John the Baptist, some you're Elijah, others think you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But he, Jesus, saith unto them, but whom say you that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, period. That's as much as he said. Was it enough? Yeah, it was enough. And so look what Jesus answered. Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah. Now this is the part I came back for you to see. Flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, that is, who Jesus was, but my Father who is in heaven. Now reconstruct. You all remember the account how that Jesus was walking down the shores of Galilee and he came across these fellows, probably mending their nets. And did he spend an hour or two telling them who he was and what he was going to do? Not from what I understand in Scripture. What did he tell them? Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. And what did those men do? They dropped their tools, they dropped their nets, and they followed. Now, have you ever asked, why? Why? Well, here's the reason why. Because, you see... God opened the eyes of these fishermen that here was the promised Messiah, and nothing need more be said. And that's what Jesus is saying. Peter, somebody didn't twist your arm to believe who I am. Somebody hasn't spent three years trying to tell you who I am. The Father opened your understanding, see? And so he said, blessed. 
And it's because he was a believer now. But he said, No flesh and blood hath revealed it unto thee, but my Father who is in heaven. In other words, it had to be a supernatural opening of even Peter's understanding. Has anything changed? No. No. The only thing is now we refer to as the Spirit opening it rather than the Father, but nevertheless they're all part of the Godhead, so that becomes uh, irrelevant. All right, now let's take another one that I've used over and over, and whenever I tell people I pray almost every day for Lydia's, I'm not talking about anything with regard to the feminine gender, I'm talking about the circumstance. Acts chapter 16. And I do, almost every morning, I'll say, Lord, now today, as those programs go out, give me Lydia's by the hundreds. Yes, by the thousands. And what am I talking about? You know, I used this expression to a pastor out in Carolina last summer, and he knew exactly what I was talking about. He said, you know, I had never thought of it that way. But he said, God had to open the heart. I said, that's exactly right. Okay, now look what it says. Verse 13, they're up in Philippi, Paul and uh, Silas, and they've come outside the city, and uh, verse 13, on the Sabbath we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made. In other words, these ladies were probably just having a devotional. I think they were Jewish. And we sat down and spoke unto the women who resorted thither, and a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple, of the city of Thyatira, who worshipped God. See, so she was a, a good Jew. They heard us. Now here's the part I pray for. Whether it's man or woman, boy or girl, that's irrelevant. Whose heart the Lord opened. And when the Lord opened her heart, what happened? She attended or listened to the things spoken by Paul. And what do you suppose Paul told her? Christ died for your sins. And he arose from the dead. And she attended to that and believed it. But would it have done Paul any good had the Lord not opened her heart? No. See, and that has not changed. The Lord still has to open the heart of that lost person so that they will listen and come to the place of believing it. All right, let me take you to another one. Let's go to 2 Corinthians. And I may want to use this verse again a little later in Colossians, but that won't hurt. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. <coughs> 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. And this is along this same line of thinking, see? All got it? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. Now remember what we just saw. Peter, blessed art thou, for the Father hath revealed it unto thee. Lydia was the one whose heart the Lord opened. Now remember, both of these people were in the same circumstance that these people are in 2 Corinthians 4. Every human being is. All right, verse 3. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are what? Lost. And that's every human being until they're saved. They're lost. All right, now verse 4. In whom? That is in these lost people. Good people as well as the bad. Oh, there's going to be millions of good people that are going to miss heaven. You know, I always have to think when I say something like that, the old Negro spiritual, you remember? Going to be a lot of people think they're going and they're not going to get there. You've heard it. I can't, that's not the exact word, but that's the thought. There's a lot of people that think they're going there and they're not going to be there. All right, here's the reason. Verse 4, in whom, that is, in these lost people, the God of this world has blinded the minds of them who believe not, 
lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image or the visible aspect of God, should shine unto them? Who is fighting constantly to keep people in the dark? Satan is. That's his job. And as soon as a person becomes a believer, then his job becomes one of throwing doubt in their way and throwing all kinds of problems into the life of the believer. That, that's Satan's joy and desire, see? But first, he's going to keep the minds of them who believe not blinded, lest the glorious gospel of Christ should shine unto them. All right, but now then, verse 6, by the power of God, this is what happens. For God, who commanded the light, to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. All right, how do you and I come to realize that first and foremost, who Jesus was? How do we get to realize that he died for my sin and rose from the dead? God has to reveal it. God has to open our understanding. And I could stand here and teach that I'm blue in the face, and if God doesn't open the hearts, I'm wasting my breath. And that's the way it is all through Scripture, see? All right, so now then, as you come back to Colossians, this is the whole idea again. Paul is thanking God the Father for having opened the hearts and the minds of these Colossi believers and has delivered them, verse 13, from the power of darkness, the chains of Satan. But for these people, darkness was paganism, which is even far darker than our Western civilization. And so the Lord opened their eyes and delivered them from the power of darkness, and at the same moment, he translated or transplanted, I guess in an area like eastern Oklahoma where everybody's got flowers and gardens, that's a better word. When you transplant, what do you do? You take a plant from that particular place and you replant it over here. Well, that's what God did with us. He took us out of darkness and he literally transplanted us into the kingdom of heaven and our eternal abode, and our position, see? And so he hath translated. All right, now a verse that we studied just several weeks ago in Philippians, so it won't hurt to review it. Back up a page or two to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, and drop down to verse 10. Uh, 20, I'm sorry. Philippians 3, verse 20. Philippians 3, 20. For our, now the King James still used the word conversation. If you got a new translation, what does it say? Citizenship? Okay, that's the way it should be, I think. For our citizenship is where? In heaven. How did our citizenship get transplanted from the earthly domain to heaven? Colossians 1. God the Father has transplanted us from darkness into the kingdom of His dear Son. Now, isn't that something? Now, that's not so deep. And yet, very few people have this concept. Very few people understand that when they were saved, they were literally made a citizen of a heavenly kingdom, which of course will tie us then to when Christ returns and yet sets up his kingdom on earth and we'll be part of that. All right, so our citizenship is in heaven. And lest you think it's a play on words, Paul by inspiration tells us exactly what heaven he's talking about. The abode of God. From whence, see, we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that is what God has done by virtue of our faith in the gospel. He has opened our eyes, he has broken those chains of darkness, and he has transplanted us into 
the kingdom of his dear son. Okay, now in the six minutes we got left, I want to take the next verse. And it's going to take six minutes, believe me. The next verse, verse 14. And the first thing you're going to notice that in a lot of your new translation, the word blood isn't in there. And for whatever reason, I'm not going to make comment on it, but my good old King James still has it. And here it is. Verse 14, Colossians 1. In whom, that is in the Son, up there in verse 13, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. All right, now we're going to have to probably move a little quicker. Go all the way back to the right to Hebrews, verse that we haven't used for a long time. We certainly have in the past, but it hasn't been a while. Hebrews chapter 8, 9, I'm sorry. Hebrews 9, honey, and verse 22. Hebrews 9, verse 22. All got it? Hebrews 9, verse 22. Now I'm giving you time, like I said before. The people will write and say, don't go so fast. Give me time to find it. All right. Almost, Paul writes, almost all things are by the law, that is back in the sacrificial economy, all things by the law were purged with blood and without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Now, I call that an absolute. That's an absolute. You know, they're trying to tell us today there are no absolutes. I beg to differ. There are absolutes, and this is one of them. That without the shedding of blood, there has never been a forgiveness of any sin. You go right back to the Garden of Eden, and Adam and Eve had sinned and were expelled. What's the first thing that God does to restore them? Kills the animals. It was a blood sacrifice. Now it's amazing how that Satan counterfeits everything that is perfect in God's economy and adulterates it in the process. Now, if you know anything about paganism, if you've ever had missionaries come home, especially years back, come home from some of these almost uncivilized areas, what were they constantly doing in their tribal rituals? Killing animals or roosters or birds, sprinkling the blood, just smattering it all over? Why? Well, that was Satan's counterfeit. And so almost every culture up through human history has had a constant bath of sacrificial blood. But that was the counterfeit. That was the adulteration. The true system of blood sacrifice was what God instituted with Adam and Eve and then brought it up and you might say perfected it with the law and the temple worship. And it all was centered on the animal sacrifices. You know that, the Passover lamb. And uh, I've showed you from Scripture that when Israel would sin a particular sin, there was a particular sacrifice that they would have to bring. It could be a turtle dove, it could be a goat or whatever, but it was always a blood sacrifice. Because without the shedding of blood, there has never been forgiven. Now, I know... Today, we don't hear anything anymore about the, the blood concept. But listen, it's the way the sovereign God ordained it, that without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sin. And of course, I feel that the reason for that is that back in Genesis 9, it tells us that life is in the blood. And you cannot get new life without death happening first, and death is signified by shed blood. And so you follow this all the way through God's whole dealing with the human race, leading up to his own supreme sacrifice, which had to be a shedding of blood. That's why he could never have been hung. See? 
he could have never died a death by hanging, which was a typical capital punishment way of putting people to death. But it wouldn't have worked, because then there wouldn't have been the shed blood. And it had to be a death where there would be that shedding of blood. It had to be, because that's the way the sovereign God ordained it. And who are we to say that the shed blood is no longer of consequence? Well, anyone who does is in danger of hellfire, because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. All right, now then, let's see how Paul enlarges on it. Come back with me again to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Starting at verse 23. <clears throat> Romans 3, verse 23. For all, every last single human being, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But it doesn't stop there. Being justified freely by His grace, that unmerited favor, through the redemption. I remember that was the word in Colossians 1, that the redemption through His blood. All right, Paul uses it here as well. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now you all know what word redemption means. It's a process of paying the price and gaining something back. All right, so we have been redeemed. Verse 25, Christ Jesus of verse 24, God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His what? Blood. You can't take that out. We have to maintain that it was His shed blood which was in accordance with His whole divine plan for the ages beginning with Adam and Eve's sin just outside the garden, all the way up through the Old Testament economy of law and temple worship, all bringing us up to the supreme sacrifice of all time, the death of Christ himself. And that's, of course, when sacrificing stopped. Biblically, there was no more need for sacrifice once Christ died. Now, the pagans kept it on. But biblically, there was no more need for sacrifice. But never forget, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures, and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Felding Ministries. Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, 